Good morning and welcome to the 19th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations uh, Committee. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item 3 in private. Are members content? Good. Thank you. Our main item of business today is an evidence session on the Article 50 withdrawal negotiations with the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe. I'd like to welcome uh, the Minister and his official, uh, Michael Russell, Minister for UK Negotiations in Europe, and Ellen Lever, who's the European Strategy Manager of the Scottish Government. Um, Mr Russell, would you like to make an opening statement? Well, considering that I met the committee last week in an informal session, I suspect you might have heard enough of me in that regard, so I'd be happy just to uh, answer questions. Right. Okay, thank you very much. We have um, read your letter um, to um, the, uh, Mr Davis. Uh, closely, I mean, you're clearly very disappointed um, with the JMCEN process, pointing out that the last meeting uh, of the JMCEN was in February. Uh, in your letter, you mentioned that the terms of reference uh, of the JMCEN have been breached. I wonder if you would go into more details about that. What aspects of the terms of reference have been breached and what, uh, what comeback do you have on that? Well, there are, I think, two areas of significance in terms of the breach of the terms. One is in the wider JMC process and it's to do with a memorandum of understanding that governs the JMC and I'm happy to provide a chapter and verse on this. But uh, in, on June the 14th, um, Mark Drakeford, the Welsh Minister, and I triggered uh, the process of calling a JMC by asking formally for one to be held, a JMCEN. The Memorandum of Understanding says quite clearly that that must be held in, within a month or a date for it must be set within that period and agreed. That has not happened and did not happen. There is discussion taking place about a possible meeting in October now, but that is a breach. Uh, the second one is that the terms of reference of the JMC EN, which were agreed between all parties, um, uh, refer to two things in particular. The first of which was to seek to agree, reach agreement on the Article 50 letter. Now, that didn't happen. The Article 50 letter was never tabled, it was never discussed uh, during the entire process. And uh, it, the meeting stopped on the 8th of February, I think, because there would have been a requirement or a pressure during February and into March to, to talk about the Article 50 letter. But the second part of those terms of reference say that there should be, uh, insofar as it was possible, to have oversight of the negotiations uh, with regard to the devolved competencies. Well, if the meetings do not take place, there cannot be such oversight, and that is not happening. So we do believe that the terms of reference have been breached. That is also, I think, the position that the Welsh Government takes. Uh, it is difficult to have redress if you have an unwritten constitution, even with written parts that have uh, a memorandum of understanding and no means of enforcing it, uh, then the UK Government can simply ignore it. And that is what they are doing. And we have made this point very forcibly to David Davis, I have made it, as has John Swinney, very forcibly to Damien Green, who I understand will now chair the JMCEN, as he has taken responsibility for the Cabinet Office and for devolution. Uh, and we have made the point to the Prime Minister. Um, and we continue to make the point strongly and in public. You have had bilateral meetings, um, one on the 9th of August. Um, was that useful? Could you update the committee on that? It, it was useful in the sense that we'd rather meet and discuss than not meet and discuss. It followed on a telephone conversation I'd had with Damien Green, uh, I think, uh, about four weeks beforehand, and then a joint telephone call that he, he had had with John Swinney and I about two weeks beforehand. Uh, we had a, a discussion. The uh, Secretary of State for Scotland was there too. Uh, this is focused primarily, we've had almost exclusively now, on the issue of the withdrawal bill. Uh, and uh, you know, there are separate issues being dealt with with David Davis, although they come together in the lack of consultation. We, are, we agreed at, at the end of that meeting, though we'd made no real progress, we agreed that we would meet again. Uh, officials have been endeavouring to uh, find a form of words on the principles that would allow us to start discussing the um, frameworks uh, uh, which would are in, inherent within the withdrawal bill, that is the frameworks going forward on key issues of intersection between devolved competencies and European competencies. Uh, but we haven't got an agreement on those. We have a set of agreed principles between ourselves and the Welsh Government, but uh, there is no agreement with the UK Government on those. Discussions are continuing. Uh, I would hope we could convene a meeting again soon, but we would require to have something to talk about, and therefore there has to be some progress on the principles. 
I'm sure other members will have questions about the withdrawal bill and of course the Finance and Constitution Committee of this Parliament is, is examining uh, that aspect but what you seem to be saying is that that has, um, that has basically pushed out any opportunity for the Scottish Government even in bilateral talks to get information about the negotiations themselves. Well, uh, there, are, there is a separate, of course David Davis is the person responsible for the negotiations and of course there are separate discussions with him. They come together in what should be the JMCEN which hasn't met. Um, I, uh, I've ha been briefed on each, each round of talks, uh, not, in a, not beforehand, not in saying what does the Scottish Government think about this, but uh, on the first round I had a conversation with Sir Tim Barrow uh, the night after the talks because I was in Brussels uh, and received information about it. In the second round, David Davis rang me during the week and indeed I spoke to him on Monday this week. Uh, he spoke to me about what had taken place. Uh, the, I think it's fair to characterise what has happened since the 8th of June, since the election is this. The bilateral discussion, there have been more of them. There's been substantially less, uh, in fact, no consultation. Uh, so information is given to you about what the UK government's view of what happened at the talks was. Uh, there isn't anything else. There's no chance to discuss it beforehand. There's no chance to touch agendas. It's a very long way from the proposal that the Welsh and our, ourselves made at the start of these talks that a, a JMC process should be built into the four weekly talks cycle that there should be one of the meetings during the four weekly talk cycle uh, in which the discussion could take place about key issues. There is also, and I don't want to continue to complicate this unnecessarily, but there's also the issue of the papers that the UK government publish, uh, and they, they've now published, up until the end of last week, was 16, 17? It's now 16. 16. It's now 16. Um, and these papers are meant to inform the talks process. Now, some of these deal with areas of devolved competence. Um, for example, the one yesterday on science and technology is about areas of devolved competence, largely. Uh, the one on civil jurisdiction is, there's a criminal jurisdiction one. There's been no consultation about these at all. I mean, we are told about 24 hours, 48 hours, sometimes before they appear that they're appearing, we see a, an embargoed copy. You know, there's not even the ability to dot, a, dot an I or cross a T. And you know, it is, and I use the word in the letter, it is intolerable that the areas of devolved competence are being discussed, put on the table uh, in these negotiations without even a courtesy of a consultation with the devolved administrations. Uh, and you know that is simply wrong. And my letter, I think, lays it out in fairly stark language that this cannot continue. You you mentioned in the context of um, the letter details about these papers. Could you, how would the papers have been different if you had been con consulted in the way that you? I thought you might ask that. And in fact, if you p turn to the I have annex, read you, I have read. But if you look at the annex, you can um, see the. For, the for points the we would make, of, yeah. you know, uh, on each of the papers, and you know, these are summary points. Uh, but the JMC process was meant to do this. You know, if, if, for example, migration was on the agenda of the JMC, the process should have been: we would come to the table and say, "This is what we thought." The Welsh would say what they thought, which would, you know, maybe different. Uh, the Welsh are publishing, I think, today mm -hmm. a, a paper on migration, uh, and then there would be a discussion, and at the end of the day, a common position would would have been reached. So you can see in each of the papers we would have views. When we got to an area of devolved competence, you know, we would have expected the UK government to say, this is a matter for you. you know, what are your views and how should they operate? And a position would then have been reached on those. So in each of them, we can say, this is how we would have done things. Now, we don't disagree for the sake of disagreeing. The papers are, indicate where we think there are issues and where some issues clearly aren't there. Overall, if you read the papers, you come to the conclusion that they're actually a pretty good argument for staying in, because actually they stress many of the strong positive points. Uh, you know, and, and to that regard, we might also have said, you know, there's some good things that you need to preserve here. Finally, the paper on civil law, um, you have obviously law is something that is uh, devolved not just under the devolved settlement, but uh, it's obviously dates back to the Act of Union in 1707, which enshrined the independence of Scots law. So are you saying that, uh, that this is uh, per particularly concerning? It is you know, outrageous that you know, a paper can be published on civil law uh, without even a consultation with the Scottish Government or the Lord Advocate. Uh, it, it, it almost defies belief that such a thing would happen. Um, now, we have to make it clear that this is creating a circumstance in which the negotiations, were they to go on to the area of civil law, would be based on sand. Because actually, if they are offering to deliver things, 
on civil law, we, we, ha we, we may not be able to deliver them. These may be impossibilities. So they need to be very, very careful, even on the practical nature of this, that they are into areas that they do not know, do not understand, and cannot deliver on. And given any indication as to how the EU negotiators may view the fact that uh, the UK government's publishing position papers in which it doesn't actually have um, authority? I'm making those representations and making sure people know that. Certainly, I am often... I have to say, when I go to Brussels and speak to people, they, they, they treat the issues with incredulity. They cannot believe that this is happening. And it is a clear breach of the constitution, unwritten constitution. The UK government is presently operating as if devolution never happened. And indeed, that is also what is happening in the repeal bill. The repeal bill actually is written for a set of circumstances in which devolution doesn't exist. Now, you do have a set of ministers whose knowledge of devolution is very, very limited. We accept that. But, you know, you cannot simply pretend de devolution isn't there unless you intend to undermine devolution. Indeed, that may be a conscious effort now because the withdrawal bill, again, we did not see until a fortnight before it, it was due to be published. We made it very, we've been asking for it since January. Um, and when we saw it, we said this does not work. Not, not, not simply it's wrong and undermines devolution. There are bits of it that don't work. Please do not publish, particularly Clause 11, we said. You'll put a placeholder in and let's discuss how we can get this to work. Completely ignored. Uh, it, you know, it was published as is. And that is why, you know, as the First Minister indicated on, um, on, on Tuesday, you know, when we publish the legislative consent memorandum next week, it will be impossible for us to recommend, as the bill presently stands, that the Scottish Parliament supports it. OK, I'll now pass to Lewis MacDonald. Th thank you very much. Can I ask you, uh, Minister, about the, the bigger picture in a sense of what the negotiation looks like and what uh, feedback you're receiving. Uh, the UK's government has published a number of position papers on a number of areas, some of which clearly do need to be resolved early, some of which are perhaps for further down the road. Uh, the one thing that is clearly missing is a UK government position paper on the financial settlement uh, and therefore your, your letter to David Davis doesn't deal with that in any detail. I wonder, uh, given that there have been views expressed about the basis for this negotiation, I wonder how much you can tell the committee today about the United Kingdom government's view as, as communicated to yourselves and about your own view, uh, given that this has implications for us all. Well, quite clearly, we don't want to make a bad situation worse. So, you know, we've, we've been very restrained in what we've said about the financial se settlement. I think, you know, from my observation and from what I can see and hear on both sides, uh, there is a, a complete mismatch on the understanding of what obligations there are. A, the UK government seems to accept implicitly moral and political obligations, but not to accept legal obligations. The EU is saying there are legal obligations that have to take precedence over everything else. Uh, both sides see the financial settlement as being something that is a lever, uh, that's quite clear. The UK government, in terms of uh, leverage for getting a, 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 a framework in place, a future relationship in place, the, the EU 27 of, of making sure that the, this is used to get maximum leverage in terms of future negotiation. That would be what happens in a negotiation. It will have to be resolved. I, I suspect the noises off are one of the problems in resolving it, and particularly a... a, a, a with, not wishing to make too political a point for Rachel Hamilton, the Tory party conference looming uh, and a, a number of people who will be very unhappy that any payments are made, that clearly will affect what's taking place. The key issue here is, is that what act, Article 50 actually says. And Article 50 says exit framework. Now, you could interpret that as saying they're simultaneous, but there was an agreement reached between the UK and the 27, it's important that we recognise this, uh, at the start of the negotiations, that the exit negotiations would move forward and then the framework negotiations would kick in once progress had been made with the exit negotiations. That was agreed. That wasn't imposed. That was agreed. So I think it's churlish, perhaps, to complain about it now. It would be best just to try and conclude the financial issue as soon as possible. And if they're not able to do so, then that is going to colour everything else. I, you may have heard uh, von, Rump von Rumpuy on Radio 4 this morning. It's worth hearing if you don't. Uh, he, you know, as a former President of the Commission, he is simply saying he does not think there's any chance 
of progress being made in October. And he thinks it will take longer than that. And he is also talking about finance being the sticking point. I, I met with him some months ago in, in Brussels, and he's clearly a very wise and experienced head in terms of what's happening in Europe. And I think there is a view that the progress has presently stalled. Now, we, would, we believe progress should be made. We don't want the UK to leave the EU. We don't want to leave the EU. But it's better that there's clarity in this process than lack of clarity. And therefore, we've been urging both sides to, to, to come to a conclusion. We'll, we'll know a bit more today about the EU position, not necessarily on finance, but on the issues in which they will publish today. There's a set of papers due to be published today after Barnier press conference. Mm -hmm. You will obviously hear about that when you're in Brussels next week. And some of those things may clarify it. But even if, for example, the paper they publish in Northern Ireland today takes things on, uh, the, the financial position will require... Uh, wise heads on both sides, and a compromise. I, I perhaps would commend a, a paper by Charles Grant last week, who's, as you know, a member of the First Minister's Standing Council, where he talks about the, the need to find a compromise. And of course, the compromise is the single market membership. If you were to accept the single market membership, even as a, tr a transition, though I think it should be steady state, but if you were to accept that, that would change the nature of the negotiations, including the financial negotiations. Uh, and therefore, there is a way through this that comes from an acceptance of single market membership and, and customs union membership. Can I ask, and I, I don't want to ask you to um, go further than you have in expressing a view about the final nature of the financial settlement, but have you taken a view as to the legal position, uh, given that this has, uh, is partly a debate about legal obligation? No, I, I don't think that's particularly helpful from our position. I mean, I, you know, I, I think if you, this is not leaving a tennis club, you know, which is, I think, a, a position that one of the UKIP MEPs had likened it to. This is a, the ending of a complex relationship after 40 years. Uh, therefore, there will be elements of law involved in it. Uh, <coughs> and there will be obligations. Uh, you know, if you have uh, committed yourself to the budget of the institution for a period of time, then clearly the other members will want you to fulfil your obligations which they thought they were going to, uh, that was going to happen and they planned accordingly. But it's going to, in the end, come down to negotiation and in the end it's going to come down to compromise and it has to. Uh, and it would be important to realise that sooner rather than later. Really this is not a matter that sh anyone should see in terms of strict legality. It's a political resolution that's required. I think, it, I think you have to accept there are elements of legality in it. I think to that regard, I disagree with the, the view that this is about moral, moral and political obligation and not law. But it is also a matter of moral and political obligation. And in the end, politics will rule it. Can I ask about the other, the third? We've, we've, there, are, there are clearly three areas where, three central areas where there, the agreement you referred to uh, uh, suggested needed to be addressed before moving on to the second phase of negotiations, citizens' rights, and I, I know other colleagues will ask about. Can I ask about the position regarding Ireland and particularly regarding questions around customs because the UK government has sought to bring forward customs proposals for the future relationship as a way to uh, attempt to address the Irish uh, conundrum? And I wonder, uh, I, I, I note the points you make in your uh, annexes of your letter to David Davis, but I wonder uh, if you believe that there is an, a, a, a way to make progress in that area that doesn't involve a customs union in which the United Kingdom remains with the European Union. I think we'll know more when we see the paper on Northern Ireland today, but from what we understand that's in that paper, I think the EU is sceptical that you can have um, no customs union uh, and, and, and still have no border. Um, I think that there is a view that that's not likely to be possible. Uh, you know, Sweden and Norway is used as an example. And Sweden and Norway is a light touch border, but it's still a border. Um, so I, I think there is an issue in there which requires to be resolved. I know the Irish government has expressed scepticism that the technological solutions will be enough. Um, and there have been a lot of potential issues raised around that. We've always taken the position that the Irish situation is so special and requires such special handling that you know we would want to support a positive solution and we're not going to dig in on either side of that uh, but we do note that it, you know if the eu does suggest a differentiated solution 
there, you know, there are clear issues in there with regard to our proposals and other proposals for differentiated solutions within the rest of the UK. Uh, you know, Welsh have made the same point about differentiated solutions. So if a differentiated solution is possible, then it should be discussed. We're also, the Northern Irish paper from the UK government also raised the prospect of migration being managed, for example, in the workplace. Issues which we have supported. Uh, we note, for example, I think the Institute of Directors now supports, the STUC supports. So, you know, the issue of devolving migration responsibility uh, would be one that should go on the table. So there are issues to be discussed there, but I'd be keen to see the paper. I think just to be absolutely clear about the timescale for the Northern Ireland issue, I think the expectation has been that, that there wouldn't be a resolution of the Northern Irish issue in the negotiations in the exit, first part of the exit round. That would be a long-term thing, but there needs to be continued progress. And indeed, I think both sides acknowledged last week there had been progress on the common travel area, uh, which is a, a crucial part of it. And the common travel area is absolutely essential. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, Tavi Scott. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask about um, the repeal bill. Um, you, the Minister said earlier on uh, to the Kavina that um, it could be construed that the UK government are deliberately undermining devolution. Are you sure they're that clever or even that united? <laughs> uh, I don't want to make that as a, as a key point because I don't know that it's a situation. But I have argued in the past, and I think it's a tolerable argument to consider, even you know, if, if, if in the end it's not provable. If you are... Um, a passionate proponent of leaving the EU and taking back control, uh, one of the, you know, and refusing to acknowledge that the European Court of Justice would have jurisdiction, then you would be in the position of, of actually supporting, as such people do support, the absolute sovereignty of the UK Parliament. That would also be something that would make you think that devolution was a bit of an irritant to you, because that you know is about, at least in some areas, devolved um, decision making. So if you were hostile to the EU, hostile to the European Court of Justice, it's odds on you'd be hostile to devolution as well. But I think it also that it is just there's a lack of knowledge of devolution. I think you have to recognise devolution has been operating now for 18 years. Um, you know, many UK ministers will have very limited uh, engagement with, with devolved competencies. Um, you know, there are not many areas that actually straddle. Uh, and therefore, there will be a lack of experience. I don't think Damien Green has been in a a government job which actually required him to be deeply involved in devolution. Uh, and therefore there will be uh, you know, a lack of knowledge and, and of how it operates. And it's very important from time to time to remind the UK government that there, is, uh, there are established ways of working. It just strikes me that um, the, the UK government can't sort out positions on most aspects of what's going on, whether it's the transition or, or whatever. So the idea that they're they've actually worked out their position towards Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland beyond me, completely beyond me. Um, in, on the process, however, I suppose I'd probably ask a process question. Um, uh, have officials, uh, Mr Russell, in your department and indeed in the government more broadly, uh, been kept up to date in any sense in the, in the construction of the repeal bill that we see debated in the Commons at stage two today? No, uh, before I just answer that, can I just make a point in terms of planning and, and I think we do know, for example, that Liam Fox has you know, made it clear he doesn't want the devolved administrations anywhere near the issues of trade. So there is, a, a, there is in some parts, a, a reasoning in this, and that is a reasoning based largely on the CETA treaty, where you know, the Flemish parliament created difficulties. Liam Fox does not want any restriction upon his ability to trade things. This is one of the reasons why, as you know very much in your constituency interest, fishing and farming uh, are very keen to have a UK framework, because then they can trade away issues there, for example, in farming the access by Brazilian beef is an issue. So I do think there are some areas where this is deliberate policy. In terms of officials, well, in terms of consultation about the construction of the, the bill, no. Um, we, we asked the, it's difficult to remember when we started to ask, but I do remember it was a topic that I raised at the Cardiff JMC plenary at the end of January, where I asked the Prime Minister specifically for access to the draft bill um, and to the timescale for the bill. She didn't know there was going to be an election before then, but uh, we presume she didn't anyway. Um, and we went on asking f thereafter. I know that the uh, JMC immediately after that discussed it. I do know that at the January JMC, we'd also, I'd also had a conversation with Ben Gummer, who was at that stage the Cabinet Office Minister, which he had said he wanted to come to Edinburgh and sit down and talk about the bill and how it was to be constructed. That never happened. Um, and, but since uh, there was then, of course, the Article 50 process, so everything went dark. 
and then the election process, nothing happened there. The only, the, we continued to press for access to the bill. And in the end, we were given access on Friday, the, the, I think the first Friday in July, I seem to remember. And the, the, the release date was, I think, the 18th, round about the 18th of July. So we were given two weeks. Having, no, yeah, mean, yeah, having yeah. We, we got it at the same time. Having yeah. seen it, the following week I spoke to David Davis on the phone, explained to him the difficulties we had. We agreed we should meet face to face. We're now in the recess. I went to London in the second week, I think, of, of, um, of July and met with him to talk about it with, with officials and lawyers. Um, and I asked him to drop from the bill, Clause 11, uh, and put in a placeholder why we worked on the alternative. And that did not happen. I had another conversation, I think, the following week with David with um, Damien Green on the phone, again about the bill and again about the difficulties that it presented, but the bill was then published. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and Mark Drakeford in Wales did the same. Yeah, and, and um, your expectation of the time scale of it is it'll, it'll run through the Commons through till probably Christmas, and then it goes into the Lords. Um, the chance of royal assent, whatever that may mean, um, is well through 2018. Yes, and of course it is the first of several bills. It, yeah. it opens the door then for agriculture, fisheries, trade, a whole range of things. Uh, increasingly, I suspect, environment, because one of the areas that has risen in the, the, the sort of um, messages we're getting from the UK government about UK frameworks is environment. Uh, and that, of course, would be very concerning indeed. No, on, your, on the framework's point that convener was asked about, there's no f mechanism agreed for the devolved administrations to discuss with the UK government how a framework is to be drawn up. Oh, we've said that the best way to do this, and the Welsh should say this too, is to have a set of principles. Uh, we, the principles should uh, indicate uh, that this should respect the devolved settlement. That's the start of it. Um, but no, there is no framework. What would, the bill says would happen is that there would be a uh, ordering council process so if there was not to be, once those powers are transferred back to the UK, if there is not to be a UK-wide framework, the powers would then be referred back to the devolved administrations through an order in council. But that, there's no time limitation even on it. You know, once those powers are back, they're back. You know, I mean, one of the things we said at the start of the process is, OK, is one of the solutions to this, at least in part, a sunset clause? And is there of an order of council? <laughs> none. none, none, they, none well, all. it would have to be approved by... Both houses, but I mean, you know, essentially it it's, would happen. It's a ministerial it it, it, it fiat. would happen. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the second point on this, you know, in terms of parliamentary scrutiny, is the Henry VIII powers that the UK government are awarding themselves are not only without scrutiny, and that's an issue that needs to be discussed, but the powers being granted to us are, are lesser powers. Again, they should have scrutiny, but they operate in devolved areas. So, and they would operate, for example, on the Scotland Act. So, the UK government could unilaterally alter the Scotland Act without Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament involvement. Actually, there seem to be some Conservatives who equally have that worry as well. I yes, and I, I, this morning. I share the worry. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I share with many people the worry there needs to be at least a framework of, of a supervision of these powers, and we need to find what that appropriate framework is. That will be a big issue as the bill goes through. Thank you. One other question. On the immigration proposals that emerged earlier in the week, which are said to have been produced by an official and have not been seen by UK ministers. Um, has the Scottish Government been told uh, what the UK Government's formal position is on those proposals? Are they actually now the negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis immigration of the UK Government? They are, as, uh, according to the UK Government, the early thoughts of officials. They bear an uncanny resemblance to uh, speeches that um, uh, Amber Rudd has, has made, included at the Tory party conference, but apparently they are merely the musings of officials. Um, we are pretty used to this. You know, a document appears, it says it's leaked, it's just amusing to officials, and then another document appears, it's pretty much the same, that becomes, people get desensitised to it, and then it happens. You have a government that's very hard line on migration, and to be blunt, you have a Prime Minister, who, former Home Secretary, who's very hard line on migration. I, I believe those, those proposals reflect mainstream thinking in the UK government. They are... Uh, uh, to be blunt, an absolute abomination as far as we are concerned. But the process is so bad now that uh, no one has given the courtesy to any of the devolved administrations of phoning up and saying, look, these are whatever they are. We had to inquire, didn't we? We, we did inquire, and um, officials did speak to officials yesterday in Degsu to find out what, what was happening. And we're assured this was a leak and there was an inquiry underway. That 
and that the proposals yes, would sister. and that the proposals would come out in due course yeah. and and we reiterated our desire to be fully engaged in the process of developing those um we've we've yet to be so engaged yeah. okay thank you good morning minister good morning <clears throat> i think you must have the most frustrating job in the scottish government it's uh, 15 months isn't it now since the european referendum and We've not had a joint ministerial council meeting since the triggering of Article 50. I haven't had one since the 8th of February, yeah, yeah. six weeks before. Uh, indeed, this committee <coughs> has been able to attract uh, David Davis to come to the committee and speak to us of requested several times either. Uh, and here you are having to write letters expressing that you find the current situation uh, intolerable. Does your gut instinct tell you that the UK government have no intention to listen to Scotland at all throughout this whole process? Um, I I wouldn't be that pessimistic. I'm, I'm always hopeful that there will be a, a change in behaviour. I think the present evidence is that they, will, they are d desperate to avoid uh, the involvement of any of the devolved administrations, if they can, uh, because it has proved to be challenging and they don't like accountability and they certainly don't respect devolution. That's my view at the moment. My job, I mean, I don't see it as frustrating. My job is to constantly remind the UK government of that to make sure that the Scottish position is well understood and to make sure it's understood not just in London but elsewhere, and that's what we're trying to do. In terms of the options available to you and to the Scottish Government to force the UK Government to listen to, as you mentioned, withholding consent for the repeal bill in this Parliament, you may not wish to disclose them just now, of course, but are there other options you are pursuing? I mean, there must be a whole range of issues, perhaps legal issues, like civil law being affected, would be a breach of the Treaty of Union, presumably. So there must be other options, hopefully, the Scottish Government are looking at just now. I'm going to, you know, I, 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 think, I think spending too much time in courts is not a good idea for politicians. You know, I, 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 but that having been said, of course, there are options which we consider and thoughts that we have. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to, we're pretty much, we are in uncharted waters. I mean, we have been for, for months, yeah. But when on Tuesday we <coughs> publish a legislative consent memorandum that says that we do not find it possible to bring forward at this stage a legislative consent motion, we'll be in unique territory. It's not happened before. And so it will go on. Uh, you know, we don't want to be there. We think there is a way to cure this bill. Um, I have made it clear from the beginning uh, to David Davis and to others that we would rather, because this is a technical process and we don't want to have a cliff edge, we would rather be involved in finding the right way forward. But you can't do that. It takes two to tango in these circumstances. But yes, there will be a range of possibilities and at appropriate times we'll discuss them with this committee and, and with others. And we also welcome thinking that takes place because we'd like to get We'd like to get to the stage where what the discussion is about is about the substance. And we're trying to do that in terms of papers and publishing, and we will be publishing more in the autumn, and we've published on migration and other subjects, and we'll go on doing that. We unfortunately have found ourselves grounded upon a withdrawal bill that is the worst bill they could have thought of, which they've done without consultation, without thought, without consideration. And that has to be sorted, because if that's not sorted, then we, we would be voting for a very substantial and permanent diminution of our powers. Okay. Well, clearly, if the UK government are ignoring the result of the referendum in Scotland, ignoring the devolution settlement, ignoring the will of the Parliament, not sending ministers to this committee, then I do hope the, the Scottish government will explore all options. My final question is a brief one. In terms of financial settlement that other members have raised already, do you envisage a situation where the EU will not... Um, except uh, a situation where the UK don't pay compensation for exiting the European Union? No. In other words, they'll no, no, insist on in compensation. I, I, can't, I, I can't see a, a resolution coming without money changing hands, put it that way. Uh, I think the, you know, the present situation is that both sides would like to find the appropriate formula for that without declaring the figure at this stage, largely because the figure would be difficult for the current government to explain to its more passionate supporters. I think that's a very, very difficult thing to do when negotiations are in the, 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 you know, the light of day and there is transparency, at least on the European side of negotiations. But no, there it will be a financial obligation. That is not in doubt. The question is the, 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 the solemn that eventually is reached. 
So that would be that would be a double whammy then, where we are actually losing out on European funding and having to use Scottish taxpayers' money to pay the EU for the right to leave. This not makes European funding. <laughs> you know, this this makes the whole process of Brexit makes no sense, and it certainly makes no financial sense. Um, it, 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 no, it is utterly pointless. And as for three hundred and fifty million pounds a week coming back to the health service, you know, it just expresses the complete bankruptcy of the case that was made. Thank you, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, uh, good morning, Minister. Just uh, your email from, so your letter from yesterday uh, touched upon the, the science paper uh, that was published, uh, and in that science paper uh, there was no mention at all of, of Erasmus Plus and some other areas. Uh, and I, uh, I was fortunate it was through, went through university, but through an Erasmus scheme. So I genuinely recognise how important the Erasmus scheme actually can be for individuals. Uh, in Scotland. Now, how important do you, uh, do you consider uh, the Erasmus scheme but, and also other aspects uh, of, uh, of science uh, in terms of the, the, the discussions that, uh, that are taking place, but also uh, for the future of uh, individuals in Scotland? It's very important. Uh, you know, we, we, we have, um, from the very beginning, said that we want to see Erasmus Plus um, continue. You know, one of the founding mothers of Erasmus was Winnie Ewing. <coughs> you know, all of us believe it's it's an important programme, so we want to see that happen. I've been approached several times by academics who said they're just about to start work on an Erasmus application, should they bother? I've said yes, you know, I think it's, it's something that should continue, so we'll very much support it continuing. There is a, you know, in all these papers there's, a, there's an element of unreality. There are things missed out and then there are assertions made that are bizarre. I mean, there's an assertion made in the science paper about the ambitious agreement which implies that the UK would continue to influence UK decision making uh, on programmes such as Horizon 2020. And I think there's, you know, there's, a, there's an area in Brussels that people look at this and think, that's a, what a cheek. You, know, you want to come out, you want to leave, but you still want to be part of the decision making process. And people look at it and think, this is just not real. Um, you're either in or out. It also misunderstands the nature of scientific decision making in terms of these programs. They're governed by the Haldane principle. Politicians don't make these decisions. These decisions are made quite rightly as they are made in this country on the basis of, of academic excellence and, 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 and criteria such as that. So you look at this and think, we would have said, were we helping to draft this? Hang on a minute, you know, th this is actually an unrealistic expectation. Let's discuss how it's done, but it just appears. We would also have said, look, think about Erasmus. It's like the Article 50 letter. When you know it missed out any mention, you know, of Gibraltar, we would have said at some stage if we'd seen the draft. Hang on a minute, there's something you've forgotten in here. But w because we're not given the opportunity to, we can't, in a certain sense, save the UK from its own mistakes. I mean, certainly, regarding the, the science paper, but also in other papers that have been published and uh, in your comments a moment ago, uh, do you get the impression that the UK government actually fully comprehend what's at stake? Uh, for business uh, as well as individuals? Uh, no, I, I think there are issues in there. I think there's an increasing realisation from business, from industry, from academia that uh, the UK government needs to wake up to what is actually taking place here. Um, there's a sort of nostalgia in some of these papers for, for what they're about to lose and, you know, and, and the benefits that they're about to lose. And I think you should read, people should read these papers and recognise you, know, you could have objections to certain aspects of memberships at the EU. But when the, the scales are filled, you know, the scales come down very heavily on the advantages that exist. Uh, and these papers show that. So. A final question. Just, just regarding the, you mentioned Wales earlier on and some colleagues have uh, uh, raised issues about Wales as well. But uh, the whole process, uh, certainly from the, the negotiation element from the, the UK government to the devolved administrations, just seems to be one of uh, complete and utter intransigence uh, and trying to ignore the, the devolved administrations. But the Welsh Government have put forward a proposal uh, to have a, a UK Council of Ministers. Is that something that, uh, that you would welcome? And do you think it's something that the UK Government would actually uh, consider to be a, a helpful proposal? Yeah, well, when the paper was published, uh, you know, I uh, welcomed it that same day, and I think it's a very useful contribution. There are a number of constructs you could put together about how this would move forward and, and how it would work. But what the Welsh are saying is something that I think is, is, is very true. If you are the basis of decision making presently, for example, in agriculture or fisheries through the Europe is by co decision making. So if you're going to replicate the European structure and you feel you need a UK framework, and, you know, we would accept that there should be some UK frameworks, then you should put that 
together on the basis of co-decision making. And, and what the Welsh have planned out there is a type of co-decision making and how you would reach, in some detail they've, they've outlined, how you would reach decisions when there was disputes or whatever. That can be worked out. I mean, the Welsh proposals are good proposals, but they're one set of proposals. But the UK government would have to accept co-decision making in these areas. They show no signs of doing so. Uh, I was interested yesterday, uh, Professor Tompkins asked a question in the finance and constitution questions about what preparations we were making for, I think, uh, I don't know why they called it power sharing, but he called it some sort of sharing of, of responsibility within the UK. No such proposals have been made by the UK. Never, they've never been, never tabled or, or even mentioned such proposals. Now, if they were to say that these frameworks were to be based upon uh, equality of decision making, equal sitting around a table, then I think we could probably move moderately quickly to establishing the areas in which they would be required. That's not what's being discussed. What's being discussed is an agricultural policy run out of London. An example earlier of uh, Liam Fox um, not wanting to have uh, any uh, any input from the devolved administrations is a very good example of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ross Greer. Thank you, uh, Convener. Minister, you mentioned the Scottish Government's intention to publish more of your own position papers. I was wondering if you could just flesh out a little bit the timescale in which you plan on doing that. We would hope to start publishing uh, from roughly the end of September, beginning of October. Uh, you know, obviously, we wanted to see other material appearing. We've got our own thoughts and ideas, a lot of work going on. Um, you remember the, the, the expectation was that in October, things would move into the second stage in Brussels, and that seemed an appropriate time for us to start publishing on some of the detail, uh, you know, accepting that the exit issues were issues while we had views, you know, we weren't going to necessarily intervene with those views, you know, unless it, we thought it was necessary, and migration and European citizenship was the most necessary of those. So we would anticipate publishing in the autumn um, and, and running on from there. And what level of <laughs> consultation are you... I imagine you'll be consulting closely with the Welsh Government, potentially coming up with, with joint proposals even. What level of consultation do you plan with the UK Government in advance of publishing your own papers, recognising the difficulties you're having with the reverse of this situation? I've always made it a practice to, to say to the UK Government, would they like you know, to think about the issues we're thinking about? Would they like to have input? Um, but some of them it will be appropriate for and some it won't be. I mean, some will be a reaction to the paper that they have published, so it will be a, a type of debate and discussion. Uh, remember, these are not formal negotiating documents. These are contributions to the process. What we're talking about in terms of the UK government is the publication of formal negotiating documents on behalf of the UK, which deal with areas of devolved competence, and the devolved administrations have had no input. So there is a, a substantial difference in the publication process. But we're all, always wanting to consult and to discuss. It's, it's also the structures to do so. We just, you know, we, we've been de denied the structures to contribute as well as the opportunity to contribute. And I'm struggling to imagine what the, the end game is here. Essentially, you've mentioned already yourself that we're in totally uncharted territory once we get into the potential uh, for a legislative uh, consent motion, which is rejected. Could you envisage the negotiations getting to a point where the UK government has potentially reached some kind of agreement with the European side, which does, in the view of the Scottish government, violate the terms of uh, the devolved settlement, which does interfere in devolved areas. And as such, you would have to recommend to the European Parliament, or at least to Scotland's MEPs, that they vote against such a deal. It's feasible. It's feasible. I mean, I, I, I've, I've learned in the last year in this job you know, not, not to construct too many scenarios, you know, because you could construct many, many different scenarios. What you've outlined is potentially possible. I'd like to avoid it, if possible, but it is a potential outcome. I mean, you know, I still think there's a potential outcome of no deal. Um, I think the, ma the, the moment of maximum difficulty in that, maximum pressure in that, would come if it was clear that there was a strong majority developing for continued membership of the single market. I think the extremists who want you know, out at any price would perhaps try and push the no deal scenario. Remember, the no deal scenario has always made an assumption that the, the, the EU would throw its hands up at the same time as, as the UK. That's not necessarily the case. You know, the, the UK could walk out of talks, but the EU might conceivably say they have another year and a half to run, so you know, nothing is going to change, and we're going to just sit here. You know, if, you want, if you want us, you know, we're at the table. That would be a period of complete hiatus. So there's lots and lots of scenarios. I'm keen on trying to get us into a sensible space 
in which dialogue is taking place and there is mutual respect. Um, and I'm go I'll go on trying to do that. Wish you luck with that. I'm not quite sure how you're going to get on. Thank you very much. Mary Evans. It was just really to go back. We've talked a bit already about the, the leaked paper um, uh, regarding the status of, of EU nationals. And you talked earlier as well about the potential for a differentiated system for Scotland. I was just wondering uh, had, if there had been any discussions at all with the UK government regarding that um, in terms of sounding that out and how that might be received. Well, differentiation is within Scotland's place in Europe, the paper we published last uh, December. Differentiation was a, a topic, I presented that paper to the January JMC, so differentiation was discussed on that occasion. Uh, the Welsh paper, which also deals with differentiation, was published uh, uh, in January and was presented to the February JMC. Differentiation was a topic I raised within, and others raised within most of the discussions in the JMC. Um, it, remember that there was a very strong statement from the Prime Minister, a repeated statement from the Prime Minister, uh, that we left as w we entered as one UK and we'd leave as one UK, which of course was wrong, because what it didn't acknowledge was that there had been devolution in that time, and that therefore it was a very different UK that was operating. Um, I have raised the topic of differentiated migration with uh, David Davis on a number of occasions and with the Secretary of State for Scotland. We continue to believe that differentiation would be a, a reasonable option, but I can't say I've ever had any encouragement from the UK government that they, they think it's a goer, except, of course, in the concept of Northern Ireland where differentiation is at the basis of the discussion, and which, as I've said earlier, it looks as if the EU paper today will present uh, a, a view that says differentiation should be the basis of the agreement. Thank you for that, because I think the one thing that I find particularly concerning in that document that was leaked as well is the fact that they state the government will take a view on the economic and social needs of the country as regards EU migration, rather than leaving this decision entirely to those wishing to come here and employers. And I think that, you know, obviously they would have a stake in that, because I do think that given the way the Home Office has handled various things recently, we had those letters, the letters that were sent out to, to certain EU nationals too, apparently sent by mistake. Stake. I mean, what faith can EU uh, people from the EU living in this country have in that system and in the government when they're treated in that way? And especially if we reach a stage where everybody has to apply for the settled status, whatever that means, uh, in a couple of years' time, rather than having the automatic right to be here, I mean, how will they, they handle that surge of applications that they're going to get? Freedom of movement is, is a sensible solution for many, many reasons. Um, you know, it is also the least bureaucratic solution. I mean, what you saw in that paper yesterday was a very bureaucratic construct. And many small employers, particularly, have never had to deal with migration as that issue. They employ, uh, if they employ European citizens, it's an easy process to do. Those who have any memory of the managed system have a pretty gloomy view of how it could be reintroduced. So freedom of movement is the best solution. It's the best solution for us. I mean, you know, very often this discussion is entirely about people who come here. You know, there are lots and lots and lots of Scots who go elsewhere and who live elsewhere and, and whose interests are best served by freedom and movement continuing. Uh, you know, Scotland also has a distinctive set of labour requirements, indeed those are regional labour requirements, uh, and therefore we would be and are better placed to say you know, what is necessary in Scotland. So for all those reasons, the minimalist position uh, you know, would be a Scottish system of migration managed within Scotland. Uh, and you know, we've made that point, as I indicated earlier, supported by the Institute of Directors, the STUC, the widest groups of people now believe that would be possible. The Northern Irish paper from the UK government anticipates a system of migration managed through employment. Again, something we've argued for a long time, oper operates elsewhere in the world. So it's all doable and possible in, in Scottish terms if the UK don't want to do it. But the trouble is that you have a Prime Minister who is a hardliner on this and doesn't want to compromise on it and who sees a one UK solution. And in all those circumstances, the, the, the losers, well, apart from the Scottish economy and the richness of Scottish culture and our diversity, the losers are the individuals who are very worried. I mean, I spend some of my time talking to EU nationals. Uh, I was in the Polish club in Glasgow last week, for example, talking to, to members of the club. There is real concern from people, real concern. 
uh, and the lack of knowledge. And they go to the UK government website and they, they can't work out what's going to happen. Some of them applied for settled status, went through a 85-page form and now discover that they won't need it because there'll be some other form. Uh, and it's very disturbing what is taking place and it needs to be resolved quickly and it's still not resolved. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Rachel Hamilton. Good morning, Mr Russell. Uh, you question uh, the experience within the government of um, devolving powers. And I mean, the UK government, as we know, um, has a proven track record of devolving powers to nations, regions, cities. And I just wondered if you could explain that a little bit further, because surely we can use this to our advantage, the, the um, experience that we do have of devolving powers um, from one government to another. I'm sorry, I don't get your point. Well, you said earlier, you made a comment that you were worried that the UK government doesn't have experience. You mentioned Damien Green. Oh, okay. um, and I just wondered, surely that could be used to an advantage, the, the experience and the proven track record that the UK government does have of devolving powers to cities, nations and regions? Well, what I was reflecting upon was after 18 years of devolution, the present members of the UK government will have limited experience of devolution because they they haven't had to deal with it in their departments. You know, I'm, I'm long enough in the tooth to have had the experience before devolution. Uh, you know, and I think there were many UK ministers and others who you know, experienced political life before devolution, went through it, saw what had happened, saw the extension of the Scottish uh, government's powers and the Welsh government's powers, uh, and there was a grain with which they went and they understood it. Uh, I think the minimum difficulty I could point to is the fact that they have not had that experience and therefore they don't quite know how the system works. Uh, I mean, I was struck and continue to be struck by the fact that the, the, the EU withdrawal bill doesn't seem to understand the basic principle of devolution, which is those powers that are not reserved are devolved. You know, if you, and if you look at that, that's actually been very interesting in a dynamic of devolution. Because devolution took place you know, in the, in the run-up to 2000, an example would be climate change. Climate change was not a huge issue in the 1990s. So it wasn't included in the list of, of reserved powers. I suspect if devolution had taken place 10 years later, it would have been, but it wasn't. And that's allowed the Scottish Parliament to take a very distinctive view of its responsibilities and to operate in a particular way. Now, that's the richness uh, of the pattern. I don't think there's a, much understanding of that. Politicians as creatures have short memories. You know, and they, they live for the day and for the next day and what's coming next. A general observation, it's not a criticism. And I think we see a lack of, of knowledge of devolution and a lack of knowledge of how hard one devolution was in the current UK government. Now, you know, I know Andrew Dunlop, for example, was, was, was very vociferous about a criticism I made about the intention of the UK government to undermine devolution and said there were many people like him and others who were strong devolutionists within the government. I, I don't deny that. But I think the general drift, that there's no such thing as continual progress. I think you've seen in the last 20 years a, a, a growing transfer of powers to the devolved administrations. I think the EU withdrawal bill is a very, very substantial indication that there are people wittingly or unwittingly, who are trying to put that into reverse. Because the effect of that bill will be to undermine devolution and diminish the powers of the devolved administrations. So I, I would hope that if people were committed to devolution within the current government, they would recognise that and work with the devolved uh, administrations uh, to ensure that that does not happen. That's presently not happening. I just want to make a comment that I do believe that there is a commitment um, to deliver to devolved administrations. However, it seems that this stumbling block is an administrative um, uh, block within the terms of the meetings that you are asking for. Um, and, and I can't see any other uh, reason that there, there has been a stumbling block other than just a practicality of meeting. I've heard this said, and let me make it clear what I think the situation is. Um, I am not hung up on the present structure of the JMCEN. We did agree the terms of reference together, and I think that is important. But you know, I've said, and, and indeed Mark Drakeford and I wrote to David Davis just after the election with, with a very comprehensive set of proposals that said, we accept that JMCEN as it's presently constituted hasn't worked. There are too many people at it. <laughs> you know, there's at least eight to 10 UK government ministers at it. 
the agendas are not worked out well enough in advance. There's not enough involvement from officials from all the administrations. There's no action focus. But here's the opportunity. Because we're going into a monthly cycle of negotiations, let's plug it in to a regular date you know, within that cycle. Let's reduce the, the, the membership of it. Let's focus it on the agenda items that are coming up for the negotiations. You know, and let's do this in a new way. Thanks, Anne. Now, you can't have, there is an attempt being made by the UK government to resolve the issue of multilateral involvement by bilateral discussion. That can't be done. There needs to be a multilateral discussion of how this changes. Meanwhile, the UK government then publishes a withdrawal bill that undermines devolution itself. You can't then be surprised that the devolved administrations say, hang on a minute, what's going on here? But, you know, I would go tomorrow, as I'm sure Mark Drakeford would as well, I can't speak for him, but I, I know him well enough to think he would. Uh, we would go tomorrow to sit down with the UK government if the agenda item said uh, uh, JMC EN monthly meetings within the uh, cycle uh, and let's work out how we, we do those. Uh, that has not happened. I mean, we still don't have a meeting planned. There was a, there's a discussion of the possibility of the week beginning on 16th October, but nothing has been set as yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Russell, I think the, the experiences that you've outlined that the government's had in engaging with the UK government are reflected by this committee. Um, Mr Lockhead said earlier that Mr Davis had at an early stage indicated that he would come to see this committee and uh, has now reneged on that promise, although he managed to fit in the Edinburgh Festival, uh, but didn't manage to fit in this committee. Um, <laughs> since... Uh, uh, since then, we have seen the Secretary of State for Scotland, who had assured us that he would keep this committee updated. Uh, we have now found that the Secretary of State for Scotland was not able to come and see us. He's indicating he can't come and see us before uh, November. Uh, I wondered if you said that you had met the Secretary of State for Scotland yourself, and I wondered if you could give some indication as to whether you think that he is... Um, closely involved in these negotiations, what, what his role is. Is he in a position to be able to bat for Scotland? Indeed, has he batted for Scotland? I, I think I would want him to answer that question. I, you know, I'm, I, I don't think I should, should do his performance appraisal at this committee. You know, I, I am sceptical about the issue of this, the, the role, uh, and I might be sceptical about some of the performance, but I think it's fair to allow him to speak for himself. Uh, I, I, our job is to make sure that we scrutinise what is happening and we get ourselves heard and we make our decisions according to our powers. And presently we're having difficulty because of the actions of the UK government, of which he is a member. So you know, my view of him would be that I would like to see him expressing his own dissatisfaction with the process rather than, than criticising others. Uh, as for David Davis, it would be up to him to appear. I, I would just point out that I myself did manage to appear in the Alex Salmon show and appear before this committee, so it can be done. Uh, and I'm sure that he would quite like to do it. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to um, uh, Ellen Lever, and I shall now move the meeting into private session. <laughs>